synchronize slides with the audio. Mm. So why I became a transdisciplinary design researcher. So this is going to be a very short summary of t more than 20 years of uh, working towards that field. At the beginning, I didn't know that I wanted to be in that field. And I don't even think that I'm that field in it. <laughs> Well, most of the time. That's why I say that I'm a transdisciplinary. It means that I'm, I'm in, in transition all the time from one discipline to other. What is I'm in movement? I'm moving from one to the other. And first, a disclaimer. Uh, presented in this following linear format, this narrative does not account for all the moments of despair, frustration, sorrow, and feeling lost in my career. I underplay them here to paint a positive big picture in the spirit of being immersed in the U.S. culture. All right, so this sarcasm is important, but it's true. I want to have a short presentation, and I can for sure talk about frustration, sorry, and feeling lost, but not on record. All right. You can ask me later about this. But let me start with my childhood times. Oh, of course, I knew right away that I wanted to be a design researcher like Jairo Gearluz or Professor Pardal in Portuguese. He was called a professor in, 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 the, in the US. He was not known as professor, but in Brazil he was. That's funny, right? So I was already wanting to become a professor when I was a kid. And that's a true story. Uh, but I still keep asking why this Disney uh, character became so important, inspiring for my childhood times. I don't know much about it. I started to reflect on this while building up this presentation. But anyhow, I figured out two things. Well, I grew up close to Rocinha, or Rocinha, the biggest uh, informal settlement in Latin America and one of the biggest in the world. I live just close to that big mountain on the right side, in the middle of the jungle, but it's still close uh, to Rocinha, and I always was passing by and being amazed by the sheer full um, uh, you know, vibrations that came from there. I mean, it seemed lively. It didn't seem like the buildings on, on your back. That seems like more ab abandoned uh, society or civilization. This is thriving. But on the other hand, I also knew people and I went through and saw things that were very scary, like uh, people holding big guns and, and actually listening to shooting and to the stories of people that have been, been killed by those, those uh, shootings. Anyway, it was scary, but also inspiring. And especially by the improvisation style that contrasted with this uh, big model development that you see on the back. Later on, I moved to Curitiba. I was still a kid. And it's a completely different city in southern Brazil. It is uh, considered by some Curitibanos as the Europe of Brazil. They really feel superior in relation to the rest of the country. That's really up to the point that they, they started to call Curitiba as a Republic of Curitiba. And they have this famous judge, um, or now infamous judge, uh, Sergio Moro to uh, imprison the former president of Brazil, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva at that time, now current president of Brazil. And that's um, one of the major political up, uh, upheavals and changes in the last few years. So Lula went, was transformed into a, a, like a, a, a corrupt politician uh, by this city, but also later on he managed to underplay the role Curitiba played in major Brazilian politics, and then he became now the savior of Brazil from Bolsonaro. Anyway, Curitiba has this ethos of being a modern urban plant city, and I have to grow up in those two cities and having been back and forth with this postmodern and modern, or whatever, outer modern, if you want to call what uh, Rio de Janeiro is. That's really an animating part of my story, and that's probably one of the reasons why I was interested on invention and, and design. 
I ended up not following an industrial design bachelor. I chose social communication because I thought that everything I was reading and seeing from coming from industrial design students was not political enough. I really wanted to change those uh, fundamental in, unequal structures that I was seeing in those cities. In, of course, in Rio is more explicit, but in Curitiba there is also the same kind of uh, unequal structure going on, just more hidden. And I, uh, I got in love with uh, writing and, and also um, formatting that writing in an appealing way. So I started to play around with uh, newspapers. We published this Olinhador, that means the lumberjack man. Uh, so we are really uh, denouncing all kinds of uh, things that we found uh, weird or um, unethical in our university and selling that newspaper to all the students so that students could go could have uh, interesting arguments against faculty members for any kind, any kind of discussion yeah we were really trying to um, instill critical thinking in our um, in university environment but while doing this i somehow lost a bit of interest on journalism which was my major and I started to focus on graphic design. So I started mo move, moving slowly from media studies, that's how they, the, the equivalent of social communication here in the US. And I s combined those two experiences while writing a web blog on uh, web design. That's called Usability Doido. And I have been writing this thing for more than 20 years now. More than 1,000 1, posts has been published there. It's all in Portuguese. I also have a, a website in English that has way less content than that, but it's based on that same experience. It's uh, less personal. It's more focused on my academic uh, life. This one has a lot of personal things. Anyway, this website has changed a lot since I started, but I wanted to really show how the first, very first layout. I don't know. I was... I was really young. At that time, um, I was still fi finishing my uh, undergrad studies and I was do doing an internship in an advertising agency and I designed this website using Flash. Flash is an, an animation software, interactive animation software that was really, really cool during those times. And um, I ended up winning a, an award from an international competition that was so weird. I didn't have to pay for the entrance fee because this conference was organized in the Global South. Later, much later on, I understood this. It was uh, held in South Africa and it knew that people all around the world, especially in need of recognition, might apply. And yeah, so they sent me this nice... I didn't, couldn't attend the uh, ceremony, uh, but they sent me the, the trophy. I'm going to show you quickly this website uh, for you for your fun because the context of it I don't want to go too much into the details it's very important I was becoming a dad at the age of 20 and I was I was excited about it but at the same time frightened and I had opportunity to convince my boss that his website for his advertising agency should have a baby on it <laughs> And then, so I did, and look at how it works. Th this is the menu for navigating the website, and you drag and drop the <laughs> options. Things that you will never do right now. And there is even music, right? The website with music. Wow. These were good times. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, this is really a lot of nostalgic feelings. Uh, every, every time you click one of these icons, you see the experience of that ad agents with that kind of media. So now we're seeing the experience of DC2 with um, radio, and then you could listen si to their, casa para their jingles. And the logos that they design, of course they have grassy design services too. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, and it's interactive. Look, you can really look at the details of it. <laughs> This reminds me of like when I was learning computer when I was like in first grade. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, we were all learning uh, computers at those times, right? This was the beginning of the 200s and 2000s, and then we, we didn't know so much what computers could be like. But that's my favorite part of this website. What is this? What is for? Water. <laughs> what do you think? Water. Water. Balloon. A balloon. <laughs> it says, pull the cord, pull the cord, pull the cord. All right, you pull the cord. Oh my gosh, and that's that music, uh, that's Beethoven number five symphony. My brother was all the time playing that song when I was a kid and annoying me like hell. And I, because he had this one of these toys with this music and I destroyed that toy. But then that music never stopped playing my head since then. That's why I put it here. All right, so after I started making websites like this, I, I really loved the media. It really became more inter interesting to me than newspapers. And I started digging into the topic of web design. There were very few courses that were connected to that and my university, but the library had a lot of books. And I already mentioned to you this, that I read a lot of books there and they were like key to getting settled in that area for a while. So here's how my trajectory started to expand beyond um, the um, the major topics, the, the topic of my major. So I started to take classes in information management and also in anthropology. And why anthropology? Because I understood that this media was all about how people interact uh, and how people understand things and how people develop and transform themselves. So I had this hunch that it was all about becoming human, but I didn't could uh, fully articulate and anthropology was somehow helping me with that. Anthropology had even the first concept of interface that I learned. They used the, use, they used the, the concept of interface to talk about a space where the sacred meets the profane and everything can happen. It's weird, right? But think about uh, when the, a king comes to the, to the people to, to address the people in a discourse. That's an interface where the powerful meets the powerless. And anything can happen. For example, people can throw uh, tomatoes on the, on the king and then destroy a little bit its, uh, its sac sac sacred, sacred, sac mm -hmm. sacredness. Thanks. Well, I soon became very concerned about that technology and I took a master degree in technology and society. That was the only program that dealt with web design or something close to that in my city and uh, it was a very important moment in my life too a lot of seminars that's where i learned how to do seminar we are not doing a seminar in this picture we are organizing a seminar actually we are all grad students crazy ones mm -hmm. good old times a lot of reading too I, I i think i read about 40 books a year those those two years a lot of stuff and everything I learned there, I, I felt like I wanted to put in practice. The grad study was really the humanity side, so I could not build things and make stuff. But I, I managed to create my own uh, grad program use with other people like-minded. Uh, it was called Faber Ludens Institute. It had more than just grad study. We also had research facilities and consultancy all together combined. And we played around with uh, digital technologies and tried to take and develop a designerly approach to that. This was the beginnings of a, a, a new field called, called right now interaction design. And it was a load of fun, really, really interesting. I can tell so many stories about this. But the best part of that story was probably becoming really uh, fully conscious that design and education was about becoming human. And that's the, the background story of the name of the the, the institute. It's called uh, Faber Ludens because it's our vision of 
how what is it to be human it's to make your reality and also to play with that reality faber means fabricating in, in latin and ludens mean playing around so we are not really thinking that hum, our conception of hum, a human being is not about this rational sapiens it's much more about this playful maker and we wanted to train people to become human like that so we did it and we also reflected that at some point this was a privilege of the, those who could follow that course so we wanted to um, to free design from designers <laughs> and, and not just for designers I mean uh, people that are not trained or they don't have access to training they should all they are also already doing it they are already becoming human by playing and making their own way and then we wrote a book called design libre it has also a spanish translation diseño libre and it's a very political pamphlet that you can read in two hours or less and it's all about how design must be free from designers we also build a digital platform to implement that vision um, it was a um, a critical alternative to open IDO uh, digital platform that was big at those times and we also were the, like the Global South alternative because we used uh, non-English language and we offered a lot of digital tools that matched and even overcame the capacities of Google Drive those times we competed with Google Drive and we won in many features we were fast we were cutting edge but this was more than 10 years ago anyway this was an open source software and a lot of people participated into it later on we compiled a book with our uh, learnings it's called Coralizando uh, again like Design Livre this was a collective written book we wrote in an entire week with several people writing everything at the same time using this uh, real-time text editing feature was not using Google Docs we used our own we had our own it was called either pad we still have this platform running on but it's a bit outdated anyways for my trajectory that mean a build a big um, expansion because I moved away from graphic design got less interested on the graphic aspects of it but on the structural side I was more interested for example how do you build a, such a, a platform that would sustain for so many years how can you build a platform that is still up for after 13 years and there is not a single uh, source of funding how can you do that only with open source software and also with cooperative uh, whole, um, digital server well all of these things I started learned from other fields like uh, computer science uh, uh, I got back to information management anyways uh, now there's a short list of publications from this period, some selected ones. Um, I say on this period, not off this period, because at that moment I wasn't writing the articles and scientific articles. I was actually making a lot of stuff. But since I started to have other people involved and those people took a hard time to understand what was going on, I started to write. Because writing was the best way to get someone on board on the same page and have, having them a meaningful conversation or really a practical collaboration in one of these projects. So I started write, 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 write about these experiences, publish that, so that I would also be able to access more funding. In my PhD at the University of Twente, uh, I learned to do design research as a series of consecutive experiments. That means professionalizing design research, doing it more systematically. And I got back to graphic design because at some point I realized I needed to design board games as a part of my experiments. And I designed in a hospital design uh, game. And you had to compete uh, with other players. You would play either as an engineer, an architect, or a facility manager, or a nurse, or even hospital director. And each of you would have different uh, political agenda in the game. And those were most skillful into collaborating with vested interest meaning no let's do this for the common good but while saying that you would actually make sure that you would earn more money than other players that contradiction was the, really the, the the key part of playing that game and it was also 
a major uh, sci this scientific discovery that I made available into a more uh, public accessible format. I play this game even with Dutch kids, and even if I do, could not say much in Dutch, they understood that this was really a, a real challenge. How can you manage personal interest versus collective interest? And in a, in a capitalist economy, this is really at the heart of most of our conflicts of interests. Well, in the Netherlands, the best thing I learned probably was how to streamline the design research activity as a kind of a factory, like or a kind of a production, a productive process. So I learned how to fund, execute, analyze, and publish research. And what you see in the picture is the uh, first picture of my the first journal paper published that I got in my hands and it was really hard to get there it took me two years but after that uh, many doors opened for me I'm not uh, gonna tell all of them right now but it's really a major breakthrough because I'm uh, I'm making sure that my career milestones are public once I publish and that others can hinge upon to the same milestone if they want to follow a similar path for example if you want to uh, design a board game about the hospital design you will probably want to see everything that I have done before so that you can uh, profit from that experience and design a better game or you want to maybe design a game in another field that also uh, so, uh, stimulate that kind of uh, conflict between personal and collective interests anyway my PhD was really an expansion towards many different areas that were really far away like construction management architecture but I landed in on service design which was the field in design that could somehow enable that dialogue productively and I currently focus a lot of my efforts on service design you will see that I will come back and forth from that field but I cannot really tell that I'm a, just a service designer or a, um, my field of research is in service design I prefer to keep uh, flowing through these many fields those that are like in a um, subdued color uh, lighter color they are fields that I haven't been that active during that period but they might light up later on we conducted a various such experience while I was teaching digital design uh, at uh, Catholic University of Paraná PUC PR I uh, was assistant professor my first uh, academic um, full-time position and they gave me a lot of uh, freedom to try out things on teaching and students that was when i started doing theater of the oppressed and you see uh one of these pictures of using theater of the oppressed to understand in and criticize instagram so what you see in that picture is students figuring out the the traps of instagram in a time where the critical discourse the public critical discourse on instagram was not that uh widespread like it is right now so you can see with these masks that they are really talking about uh, these identities that people produce for others that create this kind of conflict between what, who they really think they are. Um, uh, also, another important job I took there was to reboot the University Innovation Agency, uh, Hot Milk, and we did a lot of stuff with startups there. We created, used co-design processes uh, so it become really an energized community. Uh, we took a lot of projects based on that uh, innovation agency, but the best one was probably this uh, electricity sector digital platform for open innovation. That means engaging startups with uh, producing and distributing energy in the state of Paraná. Um, there was some graphic design assignments as part of this project, for example, organizing and producing those animations that would explain the challenges that uh, the energy sector uh, were facing. I think I spoke a little bit about this project in my previous guest lecture on the expansion, the, the, the expansive characters of games that we played a lot of games in this project. Anyway, this was about $1 million budget. It was really a big project. I managed more than 10 people in this project, but I had to to quit that job for some political reasons that I won't go into the details right now, but I can laugh afterwards. Anyway, in parallel to that, 
I was also working for the Apple funded uh, developer, pro developer training program. And I managed to instill design as part of the curriculum and also to create the transdisciplinary role of diviner. Diviner is a mix between developer and designer. It's a person who can code as good as can lay out things on a, on a, on a graphic design project. It was really interesting experiment. I miss uh, yeah, being in that environment, especially because Apple itself uh, has already a lot of critical pedagogy built into it. They, they had to use um, a method called challenge-based learning, and it's definitely one of the most uh, um, student autonomy uh, enforcing uh, pedagogies that I've seen so far. So it seems like it's getting confusing, right? Yeah, that was me at those times. And I'm still getting even more confused than that. So I was starting, studying education, theater, software engineering, open innovation, all fields that were quite far from what my initial uh, trajectory. Anyways, we published quite some papers about this. But I guess the moment where I really found myself was probably at my last job uh, at the Federal, uh, Techno, uh, Federal University of Technology, UTFPR, similar to UFPR, but it's a different institution. And uh, since I, once I just started there, Bolsonaro came to power and he cut all the budgets for research and teaching and they almost shut down the public universities. So I had to really um, discuss this with our students. The students, some of them were in favor of Bolsonaro, others were against Bolsonaro. And we had wanted to have a conversation about this, but I designed the conversation. So we designed uh, many things together, but what I'm showing here was probably the most striking projects, a wearable manifesto on politicizing design, even for the for right-wing perspective, but also from a left-wing perspective. So politicizing for us meant having a democratic discussion of what, what design is and what design could be. And I realized through that experiment that I needed to include my own existential condition. For example, acknowledging myself as a, at the last, at least in Brazil, as a white man, privileged, hetero, cis, and uh, all kinds of privileged uh, stuff. But also um, accounting for that privilege and making what is right to do once you become conscious of that, which means sharing that privilege and hacking it. And, and sharing privileges, what well, became also a method form of doing design research at those point. And let me share how uh, we start doing this collectively. Um, at about that same time, Bolsonaro supporters were raiding publicly against Paulo Freire. Remember that guy I mentioned to you before? Yeah, Paulo Freire is a Brazilian educator. He developed this critical pedagogy approach where students have more autonomy and they develop critical thinking, but they also become more uh, politically minded. They understand more about injustice in society and contradictions of it. So that uh, bothers people who want to keep the status quo, who are usually the Bolsonaro supporters. People have uh, like, they are middle class, mostly, mostly middle class people that already have are better off. They don't. They have free time to go to these demonstrations anyway. And what happens that since they start attacking Paulo Freire, a lot of people got interested in reading his works. Not just in Brazil, but even outside of Brazil, his works have been translated into many languages. He's probably one of the. Mo he's definitely the most known Brazilian scholar of all times. He has more than four hundred thousand citations in Google Scholar, and that's more than four times what Albert Einstein has. And if you haven't heard about Paulo Freire, you have heard about Albert Einstein, it's because he comes from the Global South, and uh, not letting him become known is also in, uh, of interest for those in the Global North, right? Anyway, his ideas are dangerous to the ruling class and the Bolsonaro supporters. So. By the, that time, there was also another issue that hit it really hard. Bolsonaro was mismanaging really hard um, the pandemics. And he said, no, there's no need for worry about, no, don't need to wear a mask or stay at home. You can just use this medicine called chloroquina. And because of 
this, uh, it wasn't proven. The, the doctor said this doesn't work. And 17,000 people died because of using uh, this medicine. 17,000 people. In total, it was more than 700,000 people that died because of COVID. And, and uh, the, the analysts say that half of it could be, have been saved. At least some 350,000 lives could have been saved if Bolsonaro had managed better the, the health um, ministry and the public health system. It's all on the government in Brazil. It's not so much about private uh, companies like it is here. Anyway, uh, one of my colleagues, Marco Mazzarotto, in this situation that we have to work remotely, he proposed to study Paulo Freire and the relationship between his work and design, and that became the foundations for the Design and Oppression Network. The people that we met in this uh, reading group online became the founders of it. The Design and Oppression Network also had its own reading group for more than two years. We had more than 600 people participating of these uh, discussions. We also run a lot of design experience like doing theater of the press online using this uh, uh, body models, these 3D body models really exciting times but also worrying times with all the things that were going was going on outside of our homes uh, we also found the laboratory of design against oppression lado as the local hub of the of this network in uh, otfpr where i was um, teaching lado grew up uh, for in many different ways this is it is still going on now there uh, after i left lado is a uh, as a space for outreach in our university. It became an official um, outreach project that means connection with community and doing things uh, for the benefit of the community, not just for the benefit of the students or the university. And we run a lot of experiments there, especially theater of the oppressed experience to learn about the embodied aspect of doing design. What we are doing right now in this picture is uh, understanding how a design um, worker gets a lot of pressure from their bosses and for society and how they can get around that. Uh, we also design the, our, way out of, our way out of oppression, our liberating projects. For example, this modular uh, set of uh, furniture for people to uh, uh, reuse those materials and not throw out in the garbage. So you could have a more dynamic lifestyle too. They even designed um, a furniture printer, or actually a furniture cutter, cutter, the CNC machine that was made with the modules that they designed for that same furniture. It's a very interesting example of a meta design project, and but also a uh, design livre or uh, open design. Uh, but the, the most important discovery that we made at LADO, also with some uh, researchers that I started to collaborate at the previous institution, Catholic University, it was the discovery of the user oppression, or also known as userism, which means reducing people and their full um, experience and their, their, their bodily existence as an abstract understanding of a person which is the user and we are living in times that where user oppression is so strong that nowadays users are merely artificial intelligence agents that are producing some random data for designers to design and uh, ground and justify their designs with some fake uh, representations of people some very weird representations so you could come up there and say if I need to do a design research, I just press a button and it generates automatically for me. That's totally lame, but that's the same what ChatGPT does for other areas. And that's something we need to have to fight because if, we, uh, if a lot of products and services start to get designed in this way, wait for it. You will suffer a lot. We will suffer a lot. Anyway, this is uh, the last field I went through while uh, in my transdisciplinary career is industrial design, really learning about designing obje physical objects that I learned with my students because I didn't have a st studied that before. 
and um, yeah, it's growing, it's still growing. I don't know where I will go, where I will head towards nowadays. I, I think I gave you a glimpse a little bit once I show you this book that I'm reading now, Phenomenology of the Spirit by Georg Hegel. Probably I'll move towards design, um, developing this concept of design consciousness that will uh, expand the concept of design thinking. But that's a, that's a philosophical trajectory that might take a lot of years to complete or even to get something productive. By now, I just wanted to say that this story is to be continued and I hope you, you are part of it. Please <laughs> join my trajectory and, and, and